Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the second part of Microbial Growth and Control. This is lecture number 53 of module 10. So in this part we are going to look at radiation, filter sterilization, uh, methods for measuring antimicrobial activity and disinfection. So radiation is one of the most common methods of um, basically uh, destroying or removing pathogens from either our food or our water. Uh, many of you have used microwave ovens for um, uh, heating food and water, but uh, it can also be used under certain conditions for uh, destroying microbes that are uh, present either in food or water. But let me also add here that they are not very effective against microorganisms because microbes have been found on the inner surfaces of these microwave ovens. Now if your food contains water and perhaps some pathogens in it, those pathogens can be killed by microwaving. Uh, solid food on the other hand cannot be, uh, pathogens in solid foods cannot be destroyed by microwaves. So unless water is present, you do not get this antimicrobial effect of heating. So I just finished in the previous lecture that heat is a very uh, useful antimicrobial agent, but uh, microwaves which do nothing else but provide heating, uh, they are uh, not sufficiently strong in terms of their antimicrobial effects. They do have some impact when uh, there is water in the uh, container and the food and so on. Let us now come to UV light. UV light has become a uh, standard part of uh, what is called end of pipe treatment or home appliances that we use for water treatment. So UV radiation or UV light has become part of it and that is a standard physical method for disinfecting drinking water. So uh, the wavelength that we use is 220 to 300 nanometers. It can destroy the DNA and cause death of the organisms. So it's a fairly effective way for ensuring that there are no pathogens in the water. We also use it in laboratory biological cabinets. We uh, have these laminar airflow hoods and they are uh, the places where we do our biological or microbiological uh, work and the uh, surfaces, air and the water that is placed in these cabinets can be disinfected using UV light. It's also important to remember that direct exposure to UV light can be mutagenic as well as carcinogenic. Uh, people have found that skin cancer is related to excessive exposure to UV light or sunlight which has where there are no screens to protect you from UV light. So that is these things have been uh, pu uh, published in the literature. So we have x-rays. The other forms of radiation are x-rays, gamma rays, hydroxyl and hydride radicals and electrons. Now all of these types of radiation can result in the destruction of DNA and have some potential for sterilizing both food as well as other materials. The units are rontgens, uh, radiation absorbed units, um, radiation absorbed dose or grays. Um, a lethal dose I've already shown you in previous lectures that lethal dose for humans is less than 10 grays and uh, we have endospores of Clostridium botulinum which can withstand 39,600 grays. So you can imagine that these endospores have enormous longevity mainly because of their ability to withstand 
uh, high radiation, heat, desiccation, all of these things uh, is what gives endospores their longevity. Uh, these types of radiation can be used for sterilizing lab equipment as well as products, all types of products. They are used for sterilizing food as well as food products. They can be used for pasteurization as well as for insect de-infestation. One of the problems in uh, food preservation is when you have a large amount of dry grains and legumes and so on. These uh, types of uh, grain type foods um, are often infested by the larvae of insects. So sterilizing with these types of radiations has been found effective for preserving these types of food and food products for a longer period of time. However, it has not been accepted in many countries because of fears of radioactivity. So these types of radiation are also, uh, they have a certain amount of radioactivity that is associated with them. There can be alteration in nutritional values of the food. There can be production of toxic or carcinogenic byproducts. And uh, some people have complained that the taste of the food is altered. So for all these reasons, many of these types of radiation methods have not been accepted. Let us now look at the uh, sensitivity of certain uh, microorganisms to radiation. So what we have are have over here are uh, bacteria, fungi and viruses. So several types of bacteria, both gram positive, gram negative, aerobes, anaerobes, all of them have the ability to withstand uh, fair amounts of radiation. So D10 is again decimal reduction and uh, one log reduction uh, or one log reduction in the population of these uh, particular bacteria, bacterial species. Uh, in terms of grays. So how many grays does it take to get one log reduction? And you can see that the endospores are much more resistant to the compared to the vegetative cells. Then we have fungi. Uh, these fungi we have uh, aspergillus which is the common mold, we have yeast, they have about uh, 500 grays which is again much higher than any human being. Then we have viruses foot and mouth uh, disease causing viruses, Coxsackie viruses, you can see the range that they can withstand. I said also that uh, radiation is a method of sterilization. So many medical as well as laboratory method uh, products are sterilized by radiation. So you have tissue grafts, you have cartilage, tendon, skin, heart valves, all these can be uh, irradiated. You have drugs, pharmaceutical uh, materials, chloramphenicol, ampi ampicillin, uh, tetracycline, atropine, um, vaccines, ointments, all of these are sterilized by radiation. Then you have medical and laboratory supplies. All these can also be sterilized by radiation. And this is the uh, decimal reduction in the number of cells so n is the number of cells n0 is the initial number on a relative scale starting from one if you get one log removal that is decimal reduction and the point at which uh, the number of grays at which you get one log reduction is what is shown over here then we come to filter sterilization now filter sterilization has become a very important point in water treatment since that's the area that I work in. So uh, this is something that we uh, do very frequently. So when we take water samples, we want to filter sterilize them for various other applications. So these are filter sterilization units. They have three major parts to them. There is a cup at the bottom which can be connected to a vacuum line. So a negative pressure or a suction pressure is applied over here. This cup has a, an, another module, a det these are all detachable parts, so there are three major parts to it. So this is the cup which is attached to the vacuum line. That has a membrane holding um, fixture over here, so the membrane is mounted on this uh, particular part. And then there is another cup which does not have a bottom that is fixed to this entire setup and we normally have a clamp 
if it's a glass uh, based apparatus then we have a, a clamp for holding all three parts together or in this pre-molded plastic type of uh, filter sterilization unit they may be pre-packaged and so on so you don't have they are all molded together in any case you have a membrane over here the sample whether it's a water sample or any other sample that is to be filtered is passed under negative pressure or vacuum pressure through this membrane because all membranes especially uh, 0.2 micron membranes are very difficult to filter without applying a vacuum pressure so that becomes very essential so here is uh, the uh, water sample let's say that is being passed through the membrane filter so this is how we use uh, filter sterilization units uh, which may be pre-molded or they can be reused uh, these pre-molded units are actually disposable units and uh, you can also have reusable units made out of glass um, so here are scanning electron microscopes of the different types of membrane filters that can be used so the first one is glass fiber filter this is um, very common so we have paper filters asbestos fiber filters and glass fiber filters the advantage of using glass fiber filters is that when you do um, suspended solids in um, quantification of suspended solids you want to know the volatile suspended solids then you burn these glass fiber filters and they burn without ash if you use a paper or a cellulose type filter then it will leave a remainder of ash and you won't know the weight difference between the uh, ash from the filter versus the solids so glass fiber filters are used for volatile suspended solids measurements this one has a pore diameter of 1 micron they are generally more than that they are 1.5 2 micron pore diameter average pore size then we come to mixed cellulose ester filters this one in particular has 0.8 micron pore diameter now equivalent pore diameter i'll come to this idea again um, none of these filters has uh, none of the pores in these filters is uniform they all have a large variation in terms of pore sizes so there used to be a standard practice of using uh, protein solutions pure protein solutions with a defined molecular weight to determine the pore sizes uh, so those were called effective pore sizes here we have equivalent pore sizes then we come to polytetrafluoroethylene filters which has a 3 micron pore size or a pore diameter and the final one is polycarbonate capillary pore filter with a 1 micron size these are done by etching with a laser beam they are all exactly uniform and i'll come to a little more about that so in depth filters there are several different types of depth filters that are available they are made out of fibers of paper asbestos or glass uh, the advantage of using glass fiber filters is that they do not leave any ash behind so we normally prefer to use glass fiber filters uh, for measuring suspended solids and this is a very common application in uh, both civil and environmental in engineering basically in wastewater treatment where we are trying to measure the suspended solids and separate them into volatile and fixed solids they have a non-uniform distribution of pores and they're generally used as pre-filters then we come to membrane filters you have polymeric materials just like the ones i've shown over here you have the mixed cellulose esters and the ptfe filters so these are the membrane filters made out of synthetic polymeric material cellulose acetate cellulose nitrate polysulfone these are examples of membrane filters that are available in the market and you can see over here the surface of the filters is about 80 to 85 percent is pores so the amount of open space on the filter is enormous so 80 to 85 percent of the surface area is open pores these pores can be uniform in size and distribution compared to the depth filters and finally we come to what are called nu nucleation track filters and the brand name is nucleopores these are 
pores, uh, holes or pores that are precisely etched into the polycarbonate film. So you can see the etching of the pores into the film. It gives you a uniform uh, size distribution of the pores. What you see here is the pore size distribution for any given filter. This is for a particular brand and you can see the pore sizes are in the nanometer range. This is actually a very uniform pore size distribution because the smallest one is 42 nanometers and the largest one is 64 nanometers with an average of 52 nanometers. Now this is a very tight pore size distribution. But if you think about depth filters, you will get a much wider distribution of pore sizes. And when I say I'm using a 0.45 micron filter, that is the average pore size of the filter. And that can mean plus or minus another 0.45 or even more. So that is, the, it entirely depends on the type of me uh, membrane filter that you're using and um, the nature of the material that is used in the membrane. When we think about chemical growth control, so up to this point I was talking about physical growth control, now we look at chemical growth control. So chemical, you can use various types of chemicals to control the growth of uh, bacteria. In this case, we are using bacteria as our microorganisms. So the first one is bacteriostatic. Now I've already said a little bit about the fact that when you take any sample, it has a total number of cells and the number of viable cells in that total uh, population of cells is going to be either equal or less than the total concentration. Now, if I apply a chemical at some point while the, uh, the culture is growing, at some point we apply a particular chemical or in this case a physical agent like refrigeration. What will happen is that the total cells and the viable cells, both concentrations will level off and that is because under refrigeration conditions, there will be no growth and there will be no death of the cells either. So the cell concentration will be constant, viable cells will remain constant, total cells will also remain constant because there is no death for the cells. It will inhibit growth but they will not die and therefore you get these types of curves. Then we have agents that are considered bacterio Cidal. So bactericidal agents are the ones that can kill the bacteria but they do not cause cell lysis. So when the agent is applied, let's assume antibiotics or formaldehyde, these types of agents will cause the viable cells to be destroyed. So the viable cell concentration will go down but the total cell concentration will remain the same because the cell is intact. So the dead cells will be part of the total population but the viable cells will go down. Then we go to bacteriolytic uh, agents. So let's say we use chlorine or ozone. What will happen? They will damage the cell. They will cause lysis of the cell and both TC and VC both will go down. Then we come to measuring antimicrobial activity. So we have minimum inhibitory concentration that we need to find out. So whenever we are using a particular antimicrobial agent, we want to find out what is the minimum inhibitory concentration essential for achieving our objective. There are two methods of doing it. One is tube dilution and the second is disc diffusion method. So here we have the tube dilution technique and the disc diffusion method and there are several factors that will impact the results with this me uh, these methods. So we have the type of antimicrobial agent, we have microbial species, inoculum size, the nature of the culture media, time, temperature, pH, aeration, all these conditions, all these factors will have an impact on the result. So let's take a look at the disc diffusion method. In disc diffusion method, it's very simple. Uh, the nutrient agar petri plates are prepared with the appropriate nutrient uh, agar or uh, media and they are inoculated. The plates are inoculated with pure cultures of the bacteria that needs to be tested. 
Now each of these plates will then be, uh, there will be four antibiotic discs that are soaked in different antibiotics with a prescribed concentration. These antibiotic discs, which are basically absorbent pads which are soaked in these antibiotics, will be placed in the four quadrants of the plate. So you can see here tetracycline, um, gentamicin, neomycin and so on. And these plates, after uh, this has been done, they will be incubated for 24 to 48 hours. After the incubation period, there may be a zone of inhibition around the discs. This zone of inhibition may be very small or very large. So if it is very small, it means that this bacteria that is on the entire plate is resistant to that antibiotic agent. So for example, in tetracycline, this particular bacteria was not resistant. It is sensitive, S is for sensitive. It was extremely sensitive compared to the other antibiotic agents. So this is what you can do with disc diffusion method. It's been around for a long time. More examples of the disc diffusion method. So we have three different bacteria on these plates, Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Four different disinfectants have been used, disinfectants or antibiotic agents. So you have chlorine, hexachlorophene, O-phenylphenol and quaternary ammonia, quat or quaternary ammonia. And you can see the results that uh, chlorine is highly effective against Staphylococcus aureus. It is somewhat effective against E. coli and not effective against Pseudomonas originosa. You can see the zone of inhibition becoming smaller and smaller. The same thing for the other antibiotics. Pseudomonas originosa is completely resistant to the other three antibiotics. Uh, e. coli is only somewhat um, sensitive to quaternary ammonia and O. phenylphenol. Same thing for Staphylococcus. So this is the way to determine whether a particular uh, antibiotic or a particular disinfectant will be effective against any bacterial species. This is another way to quantify the effectiveness of different antiseptics. Um, I'm going to re-record this one as well. I'm going to modify this one. Okay. So here we have, uh, I'll just skip it for now. Okay. Let's come to another one. Now let's take a look at how to quantify the disinfection effectiveness um, of any uh, disinfectant. So this is the Chick's law of disinfection. The first part is simple enough. So dn by dt, n is the number of bacterial cells. The change in the bacterial cell population is dn by dt is equal to minus k by n, uh, k times n and k is your proportionality constant, n remains the number of uh, bacterial cells. We know, uh, so when I integrate dn by dt is equal to minus kn, so um, Chick Watson's law is what we use to describe um, the reduction in the number of cells when they are exposed to a particular disinfectant. That disinfectant can be chlorine, it can be chloramine, it can be ozone, whatever it is. So here we have log n by n0, n0 is the initial uh, bacterial population, n is the population at any time t, x-axis is also time. You can have these three types of curves. Now the curve in the middle is n is equal to 1 based on this particular equation, dn by dt is equal to minus kn. Now this k is assumed to be a constant but we know it is proportionate to the disinfectant concentration. So k can be also written as k dash c to the power n and the straight line is for n is equal to 1. Uh, so when we integrate this log n by n0 is going to be minus k dash c to the power n times t. Now if we assume that n is equal to 1, c times t is the design parameter that we use for disinfection. So when we do water treatment, we normally say 
uh, what is the CT value required for one log reduction, two log reduction, three, four, whatever number of log reduction we want. So these are examples of uh, the types of inactivation curves. So these are laboratory assays that are done to determine how uh, a particular um, species of bacteria or any other microorganism will respond to the presence of a disinfectant. So in this case it's chlorine and chloramine. The concentrations of chlorine were close to 0.5 milligrams per liter in the first case and uh, the chloramine concentration was about 2 milligrams per liter in the second case. So uh, these are different cultures that were cultivated under different nutrient conditions and uh, what is important to see here is the nature of the curves. So the cultures is what I am going to focus on. You can see there is an exponential decay. So from an initial concentration of 10 to the power 6, it fell to 10 to the power 2 in a very, very short period of time. So you can see that all of the cultures that were exposed to chlorine uh, were at least 4 log reduction to about 2 log reduction within less than 5 minutes. So that's the first part of the curve. That's, there is an exponential drop in the uh, cell population. But then what is interesting is that in all four cultures, uh, no I think it's three out of four cultures, you get these long tails and these long tails are similar to what you see here. So you have an exponential curve and then there is a long tail. Now this long tail can be for various reasons, I will come to that later. For chloramine, what you see is a different kind of phenomenon. In chloramine, you see this kind of shoulder and then an exponential decay. So again, you can see for different types of cultures, 1 and 2, it takes a long time before the decay period starts. In culture 1, it takes about 5 minutes before the cell population starts declining. In culture 2, it takes more than 20 minutes before the cell uh, population starts declining. So this is what we call shoulders. These shoulders show a lag time before the decay is apparent. As part of the Chick-Watson law of disinfection, the same equation that is written over here can also be written in another way. This can be written in another form. So if I take the log, so log k will be constant, some constant, and then you have log k dash n times log C. So I'll modify all of this. So this is the equation that you get. Now if I have concentration versus time data for different species of bacteria and in this case 99% inactivation means 2 log reduction because I have only one survivor in 100 so that's 2 log reduction. Yes and uh, this is the kind of graph that you can generate for different species. So this is a two log generation for uh, different uh, species, Giardia, E. coli, poliovirus. So this kind of work has been done over a long period of time by various researchers in the field. So this is kind of common and this is based on this equation. So um, these are the things that one can do. And now from the original Chick Watson paper where uh, different disinfectants were tried. So um, here we have phenol where the N value was found to be 5.5, mercury chloride N value was 3.8, silver nitrate N values were 0.8 for um, a single species. Um, so that's about the nature of the curves that you may see for different species and different disinfectants. So you have Holmes law, so you have DN by DT which is another way. This is different from the Chick-Watson law. So here is DN by DT is equal to minus K dash N times T to the power M and C to the power N. So we know that in water treatment practice, we use the T values for a required log reduction in the microbial concentration. 
The nature of the curve, as I've already shown you, depends on the nature of the disinfectant, the nature of the microbial species, and the experimental conditions. Now, I also said that you see tails and shoulders. So, chlorine, as you see, has a tail. It provides a tail in the inactivation assay. And in chloramine, you see shoulders. Now, what is the reason for that? We think that the tails are because of several reasons. One is that bacteria, despite the fact that they are defined as free living independent organisms, they tend to remain in clusters. So they keep multiplying, but they remain in clusters, which we call aggregates. So when these aggregates are exposed to the disinfectant, the top level of cells will be exposed to the disinfectant, but the internal uh, cells that are part of the aggregate are not going to be exposed to the disinfectant because they are protected by the other cells. So that is one reason that you get survivors. That is, like I said, one reason. The second reason is bacterial resistance to the disinfectant or the survival of resistant bacteria. So the Darwinian principle, survival of the fittest, means that some bacteria will die based on exposure, but the others will survive. The third reason is the disinfectant concentration. The disinfectant concentration is being dissipated, it's being consumed. In the process of inactivating the microbes, the disinfectant is being consumed. Now, in this particular Chick-Watson law, we are assuming that the disinfectant concentration is remaining constant, which is not true. We know for a fact that it uh, gets consumed or dissipated. And because the concentration is going down, obviously, the number of cells that are being exposed to this concentration is also going to be uh, able to survive the lower concentration. So the death rate will decrease as the disinfectant concentration decreases over time. So these are some of the reasons that may be responsible for these long tails. What about the shoulders with chlorine, chloramine? Again, we think it's because of aggregation. So when the cells are aggregated or attached to surfaces, these disinfectants, especially chloramine, which is a very slow or a, a poor oxidizing agent, it has a very slow reaction time. It will, it will take a long time to penetrate through biofilms because when bacteria are attached to surfaces, they are in the form of biofilms. I've already shown you biofilms. So it takes a long time for chloramine to penetrate into the cells when they are attached to surfaces or when they are in the form of aggregates. That brings me to the end of this lecture. Thank you.